on understanding why it is that God said in the last days, he's going to be calling an Elijah people. And so I'm going to be talking about the Elijah generation, the Elijah anointing this afternoon. Um, I'm not sure if I've been live. I trust I'm live now. It's wonderful to be with you this afternoon. And I'm going to be talking about the spirit of Elijah this afternoon and what it means to have the mantle or the spirit of Elijah on us in these last days. So, Father God, I just want to bring this message to you. I plead your blood over this message. I pray over the the internet i thank you for such clarity over the internet i thank you father god for just such a clear message that it be well understood well received and that you will anoint me as i speak this afternoon that i will represent you well and that you will be glorified and that people will hear your heart through the message that i bring i thank you for that in jesus mighty name thank you lord jesus okay so i'm going to start this afternoon by just looking at malachi and it says in Malachi 4, the very last passage of the very last scripture of the Old Testament, it says this, Malachi 4, verse 4, easy to remember. Remember the law of my servant Moses and the decrees and the laws given him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the, the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. Now that's a very strong message that um, the Old Testament ends up with and Malachi ends up with saying that there's an incredible importance to understand that there's going to be those carrying the mantle of Elijah that are going to be raised up in the last days and that they were raised up with a commission and with a mission and that is to turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children and the children back to the fathers or the land would be cursed. And my friends, I just want to share with you this afternoon that God has had a plan all the time and that he has called us to align with his plan. And that is the commission that he has for us. And if we turn to 1 Kings, we are introduced to Elijah, the man Elijah, that was the forerunner of a mantle. We know that the, the Old Testament is a shadow of the new, of what we will see in the new is a shadow from the old. And so we need to learn from that which we see in the Old Testament. Now, before I carry on here, I want to talk about just a little bit about the Israelites when they came into the promised land of Canaan. They were confronted with Baal worship. Now, when we understand that the Israelites had always been shepherds, they'd always been people that had looked after sheep. They were wanderers. They were nomads. They crossed 40 years of a desert, and they were shepherds. And suddenly they were confronted by farmers, and the Canaanites were farmers. They came into a place where there was fertile soil, lush, lush, lush land, we hear the stories about the size of the, of the grapes and how beautiful it was. And suddenly they were confronted with a different method of doing things. And they were confronted with a different method of believing. Now, um, it made me think a little bit about Cain and Abel. Because, you know, Cain and Abel, the one was a shepherd and the other one was a farmer. And God preferred the, the, of the, the sacrifice made by the one that offered his his herd his his animals rather than the one that offered his produce and so we see this this picture going right back to that to the place of Cain and Abel but now they were confronted with this and so suddenly they were confronted with a new religion <clears throat> and it was the religion of Baal worship and what they used to do, what the Canaanites would do, is that they would turn to Baal all the time for the fruitfulness of their fields, for their produce to be able to um, flourish. They made all kinds of sacrifices to Baal so that they could ensure that everything about their farming would go well. And they did not know the one true God. They did not know Elijah. They did not know our Jehovah. So they would turn to the Baals, and that's how they would worship. Now, Baal worship, Baal means Lord or husband or owner. So Baal worship was being owned and in a covenant as with our husband, the, the Baal. And his wife's name was Ashra. Now Baal controlled the land and the rain and the dew. And Ashra was a fertility goddess. And so the way that they would worship Ashra was using Ashra poles or Ashra, Ashra trees. 
and she was a fertility goddess, so sexual immorality, orgies, and all kinds of perverted sexuality was the way that they worshipped her and how they brought honor to her. So it was very flesh-driven. It pleased the flesh. It was incredibly satisfying to the flesh and therefore something that they had great pleasure in following. Now, when it came to following Baal, they would make sacrifices to Baal. They would sacrifice their animals to Baal. If they wanted financial or business uh, prosperity, they would take their animals, they would take what they had to, in a blood sacrifice to Baal. There was incredible witchcraft in, involved with Baal worship, and they got their power from the witchcraft in Baal worship. And then there was child sacrifice. And they usually sacrificed their oldest child, their oldest son, most probably, and they would burn their children alive. And that was specifically for personal prosperity. Then there was the sexual immorality that was involved with, with Asher worship. It was a very seductive, very evil, and it was an abomination before God. And suddenly when the Israelites entered into Canaan, they were confronted with this, and they, they leaned into it, they followed it, they became involved in it. And God continuously warned and said, don't, don't, don't. And he continuously dealt with their hearts. And he said, I'm a jealous God. I'm your everything. But they were confronted with this. And suddenly they had a God that they would have for spiritual reasons to worship. And they had a God that they would turn to for provision. Now, in comes Elijah. <clears throat> and I just want to read to you now from Kings, um, 1 Kings 16. And I'm just going to introduce when Elijah was introduced to us. Now, it's very interesting that at the darkest time in the life of Israel, when King Ahab was the king, and I'm going to read to you from 1 Kings 16, verse 29, and, and, you, and I'd like you to get pens and paper because I'm going to read quite a bit of scripture to you this afternoon again. This is far more of a Bible study again. Um, he says in 1 verse 29, he says, um, in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel, and he reigned in Samaria over Israel for 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, was more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He was the most evil king. Once again, in a time of great deep darkness, God sends a prophet called Elijah to come and bring order into the disorder. He not only considered it a trivial to commit the sins of, sorry, I'm battling to read here, of Je Jeroboam, son of Nabal, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidamites, and began serving Baal and worshipping him. So we see that Jezebel, his wife, and, and Jezebel um, means Baal is my husband, she introduced him to Baal worship. And so now she seduced this king into Baal worship, and he was now worshiping Baal with her, the way that I've just described it to you. And he started serving Baal, and he also set up an Asherah pole. So it wasn't just the sacrifices, and it wasn't just the witchcraft, but it was also the sexual immorality that was involved with the Asherah poles. Um, he set up an altar for Baal in the temple, and... I'm so, the light is not good this afternoon, I'm so sorry, um, of Baal, and he built it in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole, and he did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than any of the kings before him. In Ahab's time, Hill of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundation at the cost of his firstborn, and he set its gates at the cost of his youngest child. So now in Ahab's time, they rebuilt Jericho. Jericho wasn't meant to be rebuilt, but they rebuilt Jericho, which had been built by Nimrod, which was part of the Babylonian kingdom, which was an evil kingdom. Babylon was evil. It was wicked. That's where they built the, the Babel, the Tower of Babel. All of that was part of the same disgusting worship system. And now they've rebuilt in the time of, of Ahab, they rebuilt it, but at the cost of their children. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us whether the children got, got sick and died or whether they were sacrificed as human sacrifice so that Jericho could be built. And so we see how incredibly evil it is and in walks Elijah.
Now, the amazing thing about Elijah, you know, God always tells us somebody's pedigree, always tells us all the details about where they come from, whose sons they were, and all those things. We know nothing about Elijah. Um, 1, 1 Kings 17 says, Now, Elijah, the Tishbat, um, from Gilead, said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, who I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the land for the next few years, except at the hand of the Lord. Now, remember something. Baal was the God of the rain and the dew. God was the one that they went and made sacrifices to when they wanted rain and they wanted dew and they wanted the fertility of the soil and they wanted everything for their farming. And Elijah, and Elijah means God is my, my God is Jehovah, comes in and says, it's not going to rain and you're going to have no dew. You're going into a season of drought. And you know, my friends, I find it so amazing that God uses these prophets to speak about what's to come. And we've spoken about that so many times. So Elijah came and he said, you're going into a drought. Now, that was incredibly offensive to a man that was worshiping Baal to be the provider of his rain. So now he's just cut off that supply. No matter what he sacrificed, you're not going to have anything. The other thing I want you to know is when Elijah prophesied the drought, Elijah had to live the drought. And for so many people in this period of time, the spirit of Elijah, the prophets, have been prophesying the shaking. My friend, there's been so many people that have been prophesying the shakings, the shakings, the shakings. And we are living in the time of great shaking right now. But they live with the people that have prophesied it have to live it with you. But there's another thing that God has been prophesying. And that is the tsunami. It's the tsunami of the great revival. And God has been speaking for years to many, many, many prophets saying there's going to be a great tsunami of revival. There's going to be a great tsunami of revival. Just as he spoke for many years about the great shaking that's coming. So here we see Elijah and he says there's going to be no rain. You're going into a drought. And he walks away. It's just the most amazing thing to me how he just comes in. He, who, where does he come from? I don't know. How was he equipped? I don't know. Who, what was his credentials? I don't know. But God was his God. And he went and he spoke truth. And the rain stopped that day and there was no more rain. And we see for Elijah that he had to walk through that journey. He had to go through the drought himself. But as he went through the drought, God led him to a brook that provided for him. He fed him with ravens. He was never, ever without. And then when the brook dried up, God said to him, I have prepared a widow for you. And I'm just going to tell the story just to make it a little bit easier. And not to have to go in and out of scripture too much, but I want to invite you to go and read it for yourself. And he said to Elijah, Elijah, I've prepared a widow that's going to be you, that's going to feed you. And I've called her and I've told her to get ready because you come and go to her and let her feed you. And I find this so amazing because he goes to the town, he sees the widow, he goes to her and he asks her for food. That's what God told him to do. Go ask the widow for food. But the only thing is she didn't know she was meant to feed him. God hadn't told her or maybe she just hadn't heard. Who knows? But she didn't know that she was meant to feed him. And she says to him, I can't feed you. I haven't even got enough for myself and for my son. I'm going to take what I've got. I'm going to make what I've got and I'm going to die. And you know what, my friends? Many people feel as if in this time they don't have enough. And I want to tell you now, if you hold on to the prophetic words and you hold on to that which God has said, you will always have enough. And Elijah said to her, I tell you what, you go make that food, but you give me some first. And then you eat of it. So she does exactly that. And there's just this multiplication of her grocery cupboard. And she never, ever, ever runs out of food. And she ends up feeding all three of them until the day comes that God says to Elijah, Elijah, it's time for you to go and to go and tell um, Ahab that I'm going to bring the rain. So Elijah goes back to Ahab. He meets another prophet. In the meantime, we know that Jezebel has been killing the prophets because you see Jezebel, and I'm going to talk about her separately. Jezebel is a false prophet. That's who she is. But I'm going to talk about her separately. And part of the thing that pro false prophets do, they always try and kill the real prophets because the real prophets can identify false prophets. They can identify Jezebels. And that is why they're so threatened by them. So Elijah goes back and he says to the, he meets up with, the, with um, one of the servants of Ahab along the way. And he says to him, go back to Ahab and tell Ahab that I am about to, I want to see him. 
And the, and the man says, no, I can't do that. Ahab will kill me, especially because he's been looking for you. He's been trying to find you. He'll kill me. He says, no, I will see him. And he goes to Ahab and he says to him that God is going to bring the rain back. And he says that he wants to gather the, the prophets of Baal. So he gathers 400 prophets of Baal and he gathers some of the people that sit around um, uh, Jezebel's table. And he says to them, well, today we are going to come and see who the true God is. And what, this is what I love about the story of Elijah. He doesn't go and fight with them. He doesn't go and convince them that they're believing the wrong thing. He doesn't go there and try and force them to believe something else. He just says, let me show you who the right God is. And he says the real God, the right God, the God that's really God is going to operate out of fire. And my friends, we're living in a time where God said my sons will operate out of fire. There's a fire that God wants to release upon his people because the same consuming fire that operated with Elijah, that proved himself to be God for Elijah, is the same consuming fire of the Holy Spirit that wants to work in these last days. And so they build these altars, and we know the story. They built the altars. They got everything ready. They cut up the sacrifice. And then he said, but now we're going to ask your God to bring down fire. You're not going to light it. And they begged and they prayed and he just watched them and they cut themselves and they did all the rituals. They did everything that they know to do all day. But there was absolutely no fire. And you know, in that time, and I'm just going to read to you now quickly from 1 Kings 18 verse 21. And in the time of 1 Kings 18 verse 21, um, Elijah said this. How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord God, if the Lord is God, follow him. And if Baal is God, follow him. Elijah challenges them for being double-minded. My friends, we're living in a time where the, where the letter to the, um, to the church of Laodicea was, why are you lukewarm? Why are you neither hot nor cold? Why are you sitting with a foot in both camps? You see, it's exactly the same situation, friends. It's being double-minded. It's having two different gods that we're worshipping at the same time. They worship the God of their spirituality, which was Jehovah, but they worship the God of their provision, which was Baal. And they gave their all to Baal. They gave their money. They made their sacrifices. They gave absolutely everything they owned to Baal. They even gave their children to Baal. And this is the same place that as the Laodicea church, that God, that Jesus speaks to them. And he says, why are you lukewarm? You're neither hot nor cold. And, and Elisha says to them, choose which God you serve, but you can't have both. James speaks about being double-minded. Double-minded means listening to two spirits, to two numas, to two breaths. And my friends, for too long, the church has been in a place of listening to two breaths. And God is saying, church, choose who you're going to serve. You cannot serve the God of your spirituality and the God of your provision. You've got to choose which God are you going to serve. And here we see Elijah going and he just says, well, let's see who's real. And I love that. He doesn't have to convince. He doesn't have to intellectually argue. We're not called to argue. We're not called to convince people. We're not called to try and make people believe. We're just called to show them the power of God. That's all we have to do is show them who God really is. And he goes and he builds his own altar and he takes his meat and he pours water. I think three times he pours water. Water's running everywhere. And he watches them all day trying to get the God to come and do this. In the meantime, they are broken. They are cut up. They are bleeding. They are a mess. And at the end, he says, God, prove yourself. If you're God, come and light this fire and God comes and he lights that fire and I'm just paraphrasing to tell you the story and he comes and he lights that fire and ignites that fire and he burns up that whole sacrifice and it goes on then to say then the fire of the Lord fell and burnt up the sacrifice the wood the stones the soil licked up all the water in the trench then the people saw this and they fell prostrate and they cried the Lord he is God, the Lord, he is God. And my friends, wherever Elijah's operate, people are turned to repentance. They always come before God with great repentance and they don't repent because they've been judged. They don't repent because they've been 
argued into it. They don't repent because they've been convinced by some form of intellectual understanding. They repent because they see the power of the true God. Now, in Malachi, it talks about an Elijah spirit. Elijah was a man that carried an incredible anointing, and I'm going to be talking a little bit more about his anointing. We see that Elijah had to come before the first coming of, 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 of the Lord. So we see John the Baptist coming in the form of Elijah. It was said of John the Baptist in Matthew 11, 12 to 13. For the day, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. He who has an ear, let him hear. What did John do? John turned the people to repentance, repent and be baptized, repent and be baptized. Elijah prepared the way for Elisha. Elisha had the same anointing as Elijah. He walked in the same type of mantle, but he had a double mantle to Elisha. Both of them operated in the same things. Elisha did double as much as Elijah did. Then we see John the Baptist come. And he has the same commission, the commission of Elijah. Why? Because he had to prepare the people for Jesus' coming. And my friends, we are the next lot of Elijahs that have been called to rise up. Why? To prepare the people for the second coming of our King and to turn the hearts of children back to their fathers. Do you know why fathers do not have a heart for their children? Because they were prepared to pay with the lives of their children for their own personal gain. It's very interesting, as I was just studying um, ch child sacrifice, they said that, that at the end of the Romans and the Greek times, child sacrifice was completely stopped. There was no more child sacrifice after that that was operating. People no longer sacrificed their children. But Malachi writes about a time when children and fathers wouldn't have a heart for each other. He writes about a time beyond that. He writes about a time beyond the first coming of Jesus. And we see with Herod, how Herod, once again, it was the end of the Roman times. And once again, he calls for the sacrifice of children. My friends, people are sacrificing their children again for gain, for personal gain. And that is the tragedy. And that is why God said an Elijah would rise up at that same time to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. My heart weeps at the fact that parents are prepared to sacrifice their children for the sake of personal gain. They sacrifice them as in killing them, as in murdering them, as in aborting them so that they can have a better lifestyle. Or they sacrifice them by giving them into a system that destroys them so that they don't have to worry about them. There is no heart for family. There is no heart for children. The, the safest place in the world for a child is not the mother's womb or the mother's arms. And God is saying that the land will be cursed if that doesn't change, friends. The land will be cursed. The Elijahs don't rise up and say, guys, it's time for family again. It's time for physical families. It's time for, for families to love each other, for children to be the most precious possession that we have. My friends, it's not the size of our homes it's not the size of our cars it's not the size of anything we own the most precious thing we have for our children <coughs> and God is turning the hearts of the fathers back to their children and the children back to their fathers again but it's not just physical it's spiritual as well because for too long spiritual <coughs> excuse me <coughs> For too long, spiritually, fathers have used their children for their own promotion. They haven't honored them. They haven't taught them. They haven't raised them up to be sons. They've raised them up to be servant slaves. And God is calling the fathers to rise up again and to train their children in the way that they should go, not to exasperate their children. And you see, when you train up a child in the way that they should go and you don't exasperate them, your children will respect you. They will honor you. Respect is earned. It's not demanded. 
And for too long, fathers have not fathered their children, and children have not respected their fathers. And this has happened spiritually in the churches, and it's happened physically in the homes. And God is saying that there's a larger generation of prophets that's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children again, and the children to their fathers again. There is an, 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 a generation of a larger prophets that are going to speak to the people about becoming one-minded. Choose who you're going to serve. Either serve the world or serve God. But you cannot live in a way that you're serving both at the same time. Elijah confronted Elisha. I'm sorry. Elijah confronted Ahab. And he said, this cannot continue. And Elijah, Elijah went and he manifested the fullness of God before all the prophets of Baal. And we know what happened then. They were all killed and the people repented and turned to God. John the Baptist came before Jesus and he said, repent and be baptized, repent and be baptized, repent, turn away, turn away, repent and be baptized. Now, wherever you find an Elijah, they always get confronted with a Jezebel. A Jezebel is a principality. And I'm going to talk about her in a minute because I think I need to spend a little bit of time talking about Jezebel. But the Jezebel that came against John the Baptist was Herodias. Herodias was Philip's wife and then she became Herod's wife. Herod was the king. And a Jezebel's spirit will always position herself next to the king. She seduces and she controls kings. That's what she does. And when John the Baptist came and he confronted this and he said, this is wrong, which is exactly what he was meant to do. We know the story. She ended up having his head cut off because she would not allow a prophet to confront her when she positioned herself to be the false prophet of the kingdom and to control the king. Okay, so we see the John the Baptist. So that is a that is a warning, friends. That is a warning for this generation of prophets that God has raised up now. I want to tell you it's really important that we know what to do with the Jezebel because if we handle it wrong, she will behead us. She will kill us. We have to know how to confront this and how to deal with it in a way that God is given glory. Okay, now let me talk a little bit about um, Elijah. So we see that he confronted a double-mindedness. He confronted a lukewarm church. He confronted those that were walking with one foot and two worlds. He said, this cannot continue. And he proved the power of the almighty God through signs, wonders, and miracles. And that's exactly what God's going to be doing in the last days. The next thing that we see is that he prophesied. He went and he stopped the rain. The next thing that we see is that he walked in great authority. He had supernatural provision. And that excites me so much because of the end time prophetic movement that God said in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and daughters will prophesy even upon my servants, both men and women, and they will prophesy. If the end time prophetic church is the end time church is going to go through the very difficult times. I want to tell you, friends, we just like Elijah will know supernatural provision. Elisha knew supernatural provision. The birds fed him. The water fed him. An angel came and made cakes for him. He had supernatural provision. We have nothing to fear because God has got a plan. It's very exciting. He had angelic encounters. He raised the dead. He saw food multiplied for the widow and himself. He, he taught and trained other prophets. Wherever he went to the four different cities with Elisha, they met up with other prophets. They went to prophet schools. There were prophet schools everywhere because he trained and he taught and he equipped and he brought to maturity other prophets. And he recognized the Elisha, the one that was to carry the double mantle. He couldn't give him the double mantle, but he could recognize him. And he allowed him to be equipped and trained until he received the double mantle. Um, he, he raised up other prophets. And then he fled from Jezebel. And then the final thing is he was taken to heaven. He never, ever had to die. And that's another thing that's so incredibly different about Elijah and all the other prophets. All the other prophets died. But Elijah never died. And my friends, the end time prophets are going to see the coming of Jesus. They are going to see Jesus coming and fetching his church. They do not have to die because they're going to see the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it might not be me, but it might be my children or my grandchildren. But it doesn't make any difference because those who walk in the authority of the prophet of Elijah is the generation that's going to be taken up to the fullness of our king without having to die, just like Elijah did. Now, 
I'm going to just talk a bit about the fact that he fled from Jezebel. So we see that he's now had this incredible encounter. He's wiped out 400 of the, of the prophets. And then uh, uh, Jezebel is furious with him. And he hears that she's now going to take off his head and kill him. And he flees from her. And he runs into the, into the desert land. And, you know, I often used to think that actually that was a moment of fear. And I couldn't understand how he could be so bold in the one day and he could be so fearful in the other day. But then since I've been looking at this again and studying it again, I want to suggest something. Maybe he wasn't scared. Maybe it wasn't out of fear that he fled. She intimidated him. Oh, definitely. There was anxiety about her news. Oh, definitely. But you know what? Maybe he recognized that you cannot address a principality as a prophet. You see, my friends, we do not wrestle flesh and blood. We wrestle principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this age and hosts of wickedness in high places. When it comes to hosts of wickedness in high places and rulers of darkness of this age, we have authority to take authority over that and to set people free from that. But when it comes to principalities and powers, it says in Ephesians 3 verse 10, it is through the church, corporate, that the manifold wisdom of God will be made known to the principalities and the powers. We cannot address a principality. That is not our job. Principalities, which are demonic princes, are going to be fought and handled by angels. And that's what we have to understand. Daniel understood that. And when he was praying, angel Gabriel came and she came to fight the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece with the help of Michael, the warrior angel. And so we see the picture there that it is angels that confront principalities. And maybe he didn't flee because he was scared of her. Maybe he fled because he knew this was not his war. And my friends, we need to understand something. It is not our war to fight Jezebels. We have to identify them. We have to have nothing to do with them. We have to bring correction. We have to identify their ploy and to see what they're operating. We have to see the fruit, but we're not to have anything to do with them. Because it says in Revelations, and I just want to go there quickly, and then um, it says in Revelations, uh, where is it now, 2 verse 20. I'm wearing double glasses because the light's not so good here. Revelations 2 verse 20, it's, and these are my bifocal. It says, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads the servants into sexual immorality and eats the food sacrificed to idols. And then it says in um, verse um, 19 verse 2, Revelations 19 verse 2, it says this. <clears throat> I think I've just written down the wrong scripture, but basically I can tell you what it says. It says, get out of her, my people, get out of her, get out of her, had nothing to do with her, get away from her, flee from her. And God has called us to get out of the influence. Here we are, sorry, it is 18. It's 18 verse 4. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up in heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. What are we meant to do when confronted by Jezebel spirit? We meant to identify, to recognize, to warn people, but we are not to try and fight her ourselves. We are to flee from her. And when I saw that, I realized why Elijah had fled, because he knew that wasn't his responsibility. And so we have to see what God has called us to do in that place. Now, Elijah did one more thing, and I want to talk about this. And he did many things, but the things that I wanted to highlight this afternoon. And this is that he went and he called forth the rain. I said to you, Elijah prophesied that there was going to be a great drought. In this time, there have been Elijahs that have prophesied that there would be a great shaking. But then he said the rain was coming. And God has said that there is a tsunami of revival coming to the earth. And from the moment that he said that, he went to the king and he said to the king, the rain is coming. My friends, God has said the tsunami is coming. And I want you to see what he did. 
it said, and I'm reading to you from um, Kings 1, 1 Kings 18. And I'm reading to you from uh, uh, verse 41 to verse 44. And Elijah said to Ahab, Go and eat and drink, for there is the sound of the heavy rain. God has told us that there is a sound of the cracking. Something is shifting. Something is happening. There's a sound of the heavy rain. There's a sound of the tsunami coming. God has told us. And he went and he told the king. He said there's a sound of the heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel, bent down on the ground and put his face between his knees. My friends, I want to say to you, prophets that have prophesied the shaking and prophets that have prophesied the tsunami, we have a responsibility right now we've got to do what common what what elijah did we've got to go to our mount carmen and we've got to go and get our heads between our knees we've got to petition heaven this is not the time to pull back this is not the time to wait and see this is not the time to relax this is the time to usher in the authority of the next promise of god because god has said it god has promised it God is about to manifest himself in an incredible way and it is up to the prophets at this point of time, the Elijah prophets, to go before God and to petition heaven and to be prostrate before him and not to stop until something happens. It goes on to say, he says to his servant, go and look toward the sea. And he went and he looked. There is nothing, he said. Seven times, Elijah said, go back. So what would he do? He would say, go and look. Is anything happening yet? No, nothing's happening yet. Oh, and he would continue praying and continue praying and continue praying. Worshipping God, worshipping God, worshipping God. Why? Because he was single-minded, friends. He was single-minded. The shaking has come. The drought had come. The next thing was the rain. God said it was going to rain. He went to the king. He said, rain is coming. He could smell it. He prophesied it. My friends, the revival is coming. It is up to us to prophesy it. But once we've prophesied it, which we've done, it is now the time to be in the presence of God, pushing in and pushing in and pushing in. God gave a word that between the time of the Passover and the Pentecost was very, very, very important that we were to push in. We were to push in for the next thing of God. Seven times. Seven is the number of completeness, wholeness, and fulfillment. Seven times. He said, go and look. Is anything happening? My friends, we should be watching and praying, watching and praying, watching and praying. And this is what I believe God has told me to do. And he's told all the other Elijahs that have been listening. And I want to tell you now, God said the heavens have shifted. God said there's been a crack. Something's about a break. This is a time to watch and pray. And after the seventh time of watching and praying, he saw a cloud the size of a hand. My friends, in the vastness of a blue sky, the size of a hand-sized cloud is nothing. It's absolutely nothing. But that was enough for Elijah to know the breakthrough had come. And I want to tell you, the revival has started in our land. When we look and see what's happening, there's a cloud in the sky, friends. There's a cloud in the sky. There's worship happening 24 hours a day. We were called to the most amazing united combination of churches yesterday by our wonderful um, Chief Justice. And it was the most amazing time. This is revival. When the church starts drawing together in unity, this is revival. When people start being single-minded, when people start fixing their eyes on the Lord, the King of our God, that's when revival is happening. There's a cloud in the sky, friends. And when he saw the cloud, he knew the breakthrough had come. And he rushed ahead. And we know that there was the most incredible outpouring of rain after that. And the country was no longer in drought. And so we see the power and the authority of Elijah. He was a man that could hear the whisper of God. There was a time where God said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been zealous for you and there's nobody else. And I'm heart broken over the state of Israel. And God said to him, go up into my presence. And my friends, Elijah separate themselves regularly. They go and spend time in the presence. And the winds came, but God wasn't in the wind. You see, God's not in circumstances, friends. God is not in the circumstances that we're facing. And the, and the earth shook and the earthquake came, but God wasn't in the earthquake. 
God was in the whisper. And Elijah knew the whisper of God. And the other thing that was an incredible, powerful thing to learn about Elijah, he was not a man with a plan. He didn't have everything plotted out for him for the next 20 years of his life. He didn't sit with patterns and strategic plans. He heard God and he did what God told him to do. He was obedient in the every day, in the every minute, in the every second. Whatever God told him to do, that's what he did. He didn't ask why. He didn't try and work it out in his head. He didn't try and let it make sense. He just did what God told him to do. And every time he did what God told him to do, powerful things happened. And God is looking for a people that will know his whisper. That will be obedient to the one step at a time, one hour at a time, one day at a time, and just do what God had told them to do. And out of that, to see the most powerful move of God in this time and in this season. And that was what was so remarkable about Elijah. He was a bold, courageous man. He was not scared of the king. He was not scared to bring the truth. He was not scared of the, the worshippers of Baal. He just manifested the power of God. My friends, we're not in arguments. We're not trying to convince people. We're not trying to change people. Choose. You can serve anyone you want to. I'll just show you the power of God. He had an incredible deep revelation of the whisper of heaven and knowing who his God was. His name said, God is Jehovah. He understood God and God is looking for people like that again. Now I'm going to quickly touch on Jezebel. The first thing I want you to know about Jezebel is that she was a queen. She was the daughter of a king. She was an evil, wicked woman. She was a Baal worshipper. She was an Israel worshipper. She relied on witchcraft. She relied on human sacrifices. She was a very evil queen. All she wanted was pride. She was a woman of power, a woman of pride, a woman of possession. And she was a woman that wanted her own power, a lustful, evil, seductive woman. She positioned herself next to a king. Now, the first thing I want you to know about the Jezebel spirit, it is a principality. There's so many times I've heard people call people in the church a Jezebel. My friend, please don't elevate people to something that they're not. You can call somebody a Jezebel, but they're not being controlled by a principality. They're just being controlled by a local little demon. They may have a, a controlling spirit. They may suffer from rejection. They may have a lustful spirit. They may be seductive. They may suffer with manipulation. They may be, they may be narcissistic. They may be all those things. But those are insignificant small demons. They can be cast out. They can be dealt with without any effort whatsoever. And anybody that's a mature Christian can deal with those things of anybody that wants to. They are not Jezebels. When you label somebody a Jezebel, the first thing you have to understand is they operate under a principle. Principality. That means they are demon princes. That means that they are very high up in the government of the darkness. And we cannot touch Jezebels because we don't have that authority. Angels, archangels fight those type. And that is why Michael himself threw Satan, throws Satan into Hades. Michael himself has to deal with him. And in the same way, we cannot deal with the Jezebel. But we have to identify it. We have to know its fruit. We have to know how it operates. And it was a spirit, it was a, a human flesh person that was confronted, that confronted Elijah. Elijah did not fight Jezebel, but he prophesied her death. Because Ahab humbled himself and prayed, God broke the curse off Ahab himself and said, but it will be upon your children. And so an Elijah can get the heart of a king to change. My friends, our role right now is to get the Ahabs that have aligned with the Jezebel to repent. That is our role. We've got to pray that Ahabs, rulers, country rulers, kings, <coughs> that have aligned themselves with Jezebel, that they will have a heart change. Excuse me. <coughs> that is what God has called us to do. And Elijah was able to do that. And we see that he prophesied the death of, of um, Jezebel. And Elisha prophesied the death of Jezebel. And she died under the leadership of Elisha. And that's when she died. And that's when she was ripped apart. So we can see that there can be a heart change of the kings that have aligned with Jezebel's. So how do we know what a Jezebel spirit is? Well, the first thing we know is that they try and kill prophets. 
They try and kill the living church. They try and stop the church and the move of God and the spirit of God. So wherever there's a Jezebel spirit operating, there will always be an onslaught against the church, the spirit-filled church. They don't mind the religious church because there's no spirit there. And it's only prophets that can identify um, Eli, uh, um, uh, Je uh, Je Jezebels. And therefore, they try and kill spirit-filled prophets. That's the first thing we need to know. The second thing we need to know is that they need power. So they operate out of deep witchcraft. Now, if you look in Deuteronomy 18 verse 9 to 14, it describes something of what the worship of Baal was. There was child sacrifice, as I mentioned. There was divination, as I mentioned. There was witchcraft. There was fortune telling. There was there was calling up of, of the dead. Um, there was sorcery and there was magic. Now, in the New Testament, the word for sorcerer or for magic is pharmakeia. In the Old Testament, it was anan, which meant magic or potions or sorcery. In the New Testament, it's pharmakeia, which means pharmacy. That's where the word pharmacy comes from or pharmacist comes from. It means medication that has been made to affect the soul of the person and to control the person. So we've got to understand that in the New Testament, what used to be potions and portions in the Old Testament has become very sophisticated and in a very scientific world in the New Testament. So that's what we have to understand. And that's what Jezebel uses. She uses witchcraft. She uses sorcery. The spirit of Jezebel controls through witchcraft. That is her power. That is how she takes power over nations. She is she is over a country. She sits next to a king of a country. She tries to control the country. She controls the nations. She sits over as many of the countries as she can. The Jezebel person did not only control Ahab, but she controlled all the elders and the leaders in that area at the same time. And so a Jezebel spirit controls countries. And that is why we have to understand it's a principality. It is not just a person with a bad attitude. The next thing we have to understand is that they make sacrifices, blood sacrifices for financial gain. And they will get people to make sacrifices. We have to understand it's going to cost you blood, sweat and tears to be able to be covenanted with a Jezebel. It's going to cost you everything you can to be able to earn your financial um income every month if you make Baal your source of income if you make the and, and, and the emblem for Baal was a bull it was a, ma a bull head and a man's body the emblem of the bull if that is the source of your income friends it's going to cost you sacrifice the next thing is the child sacrifice now in the in the place that we're living in right now our children are under great onslaught Sexual perversion is part of what Jezebel was involved with. I want, to, I want you to understand something, that there is a Jezebel spirit that's behind the sexual perversion that is happening in our world right now. And the perversion of where there is no morality, where there's orgies, where anything goes, and I'm not even going to discuss how deep and how dark and how evil the perversion is, because honestly, it's too evil to talk about. It is incredibly perverted. You know, God said that your body is a temple of God and intimacy between a husband and a wife is, is seen as high worship before God. So it is breaking down the highest form of worship that a person can offer their God is sexual intimacy. The drive behind our children being trafficked, being sold, being kidnapped, being perverted, the drive behind child pornography, the drive behind this incredible money-making market using our children is a Jezebel spirit, friends. We do not wrestle flesh and blood. We wrestle demons. And there is a principality behind this to steal our children. And as I've told you before, the enemy already masters and owns the world. He's trying to own the church. And that is why as a church, we have to make a decision. Are we serving God or are we serving Baal? Are we reliant on God for everything? Or are we have a foot in one camp saying, I'll have a little bit of this and a little bit of that. My friends, if you are in any way involved in the, in the business of pornography, especially child pornography, you are sacrificing at one of those ball 
altars. And I want to tell you this Jezebel spirit destroying our children is powerful. It is being driven by very, very rich people. It is being driven by people that are controlling the world under the demonic force of a Jezebel spirit. <clears throat> the other thing about this is the whole thing about child sacrifice. I find it very interesting, and I'm not here to expose people. I'm here to expose patterns. But I'm finding very interesting that the same foundation that is supporting the pharmacies and the, the investigation of the pharmacaea are the same foundation that is supporting and paying billions of rands into planned parenting. The same foundation. Is that a coincidence? Or is there a very strong Jezebel spirit operating here, friends? Planned parenting is not planned parenting. Planned parenting is the abortion of our children. It's wiping out the next generation. Millions and millions of children have been killed under the vase, under the name of planned parenting. New Zealand has just made it legal in the last two months that children can be aborted until after birth just because the parents don't like the sex of the child. Friends, this is human sacrifice. This is Baal worship in its fullness. And they sacrificed their children for personal financial gain. They sacrificed animals for their business gain. We have to have a good look and see what's really operating here, friends. We have to identify it. The forces that are operating under the control of a Jezebel spirit are funding child pornography, trafficking, abortions, and this drive towards controlling people with medicine. We have to look at this seriously. We have to understand this. Controlling people by who can and cannot earn. There is a Jezebel spirit behind this, friends. To the Tyre church in Revelations, God said to them, this is what I have against you. And I did read it earlier, but I'm going to read it again. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I hold this against you. Now remember, the seven letters to the seven churches were to seven specific churches. They were also to seven church eras. They were also to the seven different types of churches that are operating right now in this period of time. This is what I have against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. Remember, I told you, they always come in the guise of being prophets. They foretell what's going to happen. They come in the guise of being prophets, but they're not prophets of God. They're prophets of a different kingdom. <clears throat> By her teaching, she has misled her servants into sexual immorality and into eating of food sacrificed to idols. I've given her time to repent of her immorality, but she's unwilling to do so. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely. My friends, there's a bit of suffering for us if we do not let go and flee from Jezebel. There's a bit of suffering. We cannot draw from the abundant blessings that come from our King Jesus and that comes from the kingdom of God. We cannot draw from the blessings of Elijah when we choose to have a foot in two, in two camps. And now I just want to read to you a little bit from Revelations. <clears throat> And it's from Revelations um, 18. Seventeen. And this is where it describes her in detail. And I'm not going to read it all because it's too long to read. But she's also known as the whore of Babylon. <clears throat> and for us as the end time prophets, this is the, the Jezebel that we are confronting. This is the Jezebel that we need to know. What does she look like? How does she operate? And what are we meant to do about it? It says this. One of the seven angels who had the crown bowl came and said to me, Come, and I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on the many waters. With her, the kings of the earth commit adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth are intoxicated by the wine of her adulteries. Adulteress. <clears throat> this is written on her forehead, verse 5. Mystery, 
Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of the abomination of the earth, I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of those who bore testimony. I told you that Jezebels always kill prophets. And my friends, she's been killing prophets. The Jezebel spirit has been killing. They've been killing people, martyring them. And in this time and in this era, there have been those that have been killed. Anyone that's tried to expose what she's doing gets killed. We've even seen in the last six months, people that have tried to expose things have disappeared and died. And what's more, the persecution is not ending because the greater the power of the Jezebel gets, the greater she's going to fight against those that try and bring into the light the darkness that she's operating under. She's a principality and she uses people. So we see that um, she sits on the beast with multiple horns. We see, and that it's talking about the nations that have invited her, that have empowered her. Then in verse 10, it says, the 10 horns you saw are 10 kings who've not yet received a kingdom. So in the time of revelations, they weren't kings yet, but they are kings now. <clears throat> but who are of the one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. And so we see that, in the last hour, these kings will have power and the beast will have its power. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They have one purpose and that's to give away their authority. A Jezebel will always position herself next to an Ahab. A Jezebel will look for a weak king and position herself to control the king. She needs his authority. <clears throat> she, doesn't, she doesn't become king. She just comes and positions herself next to him so that she can control what he has. We see the same with, her, um, with Her Herodias. She was Herod's brother's wife, but she positioned herself next to Herod so that she could control Herod. And now we see this Jezebel spirit positions herself next to the kings that are going to be kings in the last hour. Excuse me. <clears throat> And they will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and their authority to the beast. They will make war against the lamb, but the lamb will overcome them because he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings. And with him will be his called, chosen and faithful followers. Now, there's much more that I can tell you there. And I know there's many deep studies into that. And there's many people that have said that the true Jezebel, and they've put it into one place. We know that she's going to be sitting, controlling 10 kings. She's going to be controlling the beast. We know that what she says is going to be established. And what she says is going to become a rule. But they're going to turn around and hate her in the end. And they're going to come against her in the end. And they're going to attack her in the end. But there's a season where her influence is going to be powerful. And God is saying to the church in this time, choose who you're going to serve. Choose who you're going to serve. My friends, prophets, Elijah prophets, prophets operating under the, the authority of sons of God, carrying what Jesus carried with a double portion, are coming as Elijah's in this time. And they are bringing people to repentance. And they are causing people to see their error. And my friends, I want to say this to you. Open your eyes to see. The lukewarm church is going to be caught up under the Jezebel spirit and will be completely deceived. Jesus says, I wish you were either hot or cold. If you were cold, I'm going to spew out of my mouth. If you were hot and have your first love restored, I will embrace you as my chosen and he's going to look after his church. It doesn't matter how difficult things get, my friends. Those who choose to follow Jesus wholeheartedly and who will not embrace anything that the Jezebel spirit is trying to put on them in this time, that will not give their children to be educated by a system that is giving children pornography as sex educations, that is educating the children to become seduced by a seductive lustful world where they offer their bodies as sex objects to be used in any way that they want to where there is no immorality where absolutely everything is accepted if it feels good do it my friends that is not the heart of god 
God's heart says be self-controlled and alert because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. God has raised up Elijah's that say to the church, church, wake up. Church, do not stop. This is the time to push in, push in, push in, push in until the tsunami breaks. It is also the time to get out of her. Get out of her. You cannot embrace anything that the Jezebel spirit is controlling. She controls the finances of this world. She controls the lustful behavior of this world. She controls the pharmacia of this world. She controls the, the sacrifice of everything within you to please this God so that you can have a little bit of money. That is not God's purposes, my friends. God did not call us to sell our soul to the Jezebel spirit so that we can survive. Elijah, in the time of drought, was fully provided for. It does not matter where this goes. And my friends, the Bible warns us that in the last times it's going to be difficult. But you have to choose who you're going to serve. You have to choose who God is. You cannot live with a foot in both camps. You cannot live in a place that you say, it's okay, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Because he's going to spew you out of his mouth. But if you say, God, you are God, and hold on to him with everything, my friends, he will be faithful. He will be true. He will help you just like he did with Elijah, one step at a time, one day at a time, one little bit at a time. But he's calling you to choose. Who are you going to choose? Get out of her. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not partake of the plagues that she will partake of. Um, Revelations 18. Father, I want to ask you for eyes to see. I pull blinkers off people's eyes that they can see. Father, the anointing of a prophet is to open eyes to see. And I pray that eyes will be open to see what you see. That ears will be open to hear what you hear. And that in this day and in this time, we will not waste it waiting just to go back to normal. But we will use this time to seriously see who the enemy is, recognize the ploy of the evil one, and be able to choose who we will, be, who we will serve. That we will go and get soul for our eyes. That we will go and buy white clothes, just like you said, to the Laodicea church. That we can become your church. Because Lord Jesus, you yourself are going to fight the Jezebel. You yourself are going to bring her to nothing. The Lamb of God is going to bring her to nothing. And with him will be those that are chosen, the elect that he has called by name, that are serving him with everything within them. Bless you, friends. I know this has been a, a serious teaching, but I trust that there's been something deposited that you can think on, chew on, think about, and that the Holy Spirit will keep teaching you much more in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen.